Welcome back, everybody. Thank you. Um, so we're going to move on to our next presentation. Uh, Sid is joining us from R3, and Sid participated in Project Ubin. So Project Ubin, uh, if you're not familiar with Project Ubin, it was the Singapore Monetary, uh, the Monetary Authority of Singapore project. Um, and of course, it was uh, Corda and other platforms uh, uh, in a comparison around applications for central bank digital currencies. So uh, Sid's going to take us through the project in general. Um, and if we have time, he can even go into the uh, distributed netting algorithm. So it depends how technical you all want to get. But over to you, Sid. Thanks. I believe I'm audible, right? Yeah. OK. So uh, before we jump into Project Open, I thought it would uh, make sense to probably spend a couple of minutes in just uh, introducing ourselves to CBDCs, Central Bank Digital Currencies, uh, what they are, what they mean. Next, I uh, would love to talk about Cash on Corda, so, which is fiat currency essentially represented on Ledger, on our DLT platform, Corda. And finally, uh, we can jump into Project Urban, the introduction, uh, what was achieved, some of the key observations. So with that, let's dive in. Uh, central bank digital currencies, or CBDCs, right? So um, 2018 is the year uh, we think blockchains are going into production. This is uh, not just uh, cash on ledger, but across the system, as in, you've seen probably some of the other presentations. We believe that systematic value of blockchains will be realized uh, with cash represented on ledger. And cryptocurrencies and private sector initiatives, these are uh, good. They, they definitely have the first mover advantage, but they kind of reduce the transparency uh, for central banks, and hence the case for central bank digital currencies. Now, we believe that R3 has a suitable solution for banks as well as central banks. We will go into some of the details of the projects that we have done with these groups. We have a pro uh, proven track record. Now, let's try to make a case for wholesale payment solution on blockchain. So what we are not suggesting is to have a CBDC platform in digital format for households, for uh, the man on the street. There are unanswered questions about intrinsic interest provisions, anonymity, uh, systematic uncertainty, scalability. Uh, there are also, frankly speaking, uh, probably platform limitations uh, at this stage. So while the ecosystem matures and understand what it means to have a retail solution, the perfect opportunity for us is what we are discussing right now is the merits of recording the ownership of reserves on distributed ledgers as a wholesale provision. So here, the participants to such a project or a network would be a typical RTGS participant, right? So it will be the clearing banks. Uh, though, of course, the participation could be then extended uh, to other financial intermediaries or a white list of corporates. And again, some central banks have already gone ahead and played around with those next steps already. So one thing that comes with central banks is, of course, mandates differ by jurisdiction, right? Uh, but there is a common goal of maintaining an orderly financial ecosystem, having a systematic stability, responding to the technological advances. Now, tokenized wholesale currency, uh, of course, will reduce the systematic uh, risk in central point of failure. And here's state related risk. Again, we are talking about either DVP, PVP, uh, the atomicity in itself reduces a lot of risks. It, of course, adds value to the state's ecosystem by fully enabling the promise of blockchain while having the central bank with you. Uh, we drive the increased velocity of business within the ecosystem and prepare the state for the next step in the evolution of payment systems. So that's the case that we try to make for wholesale CBDC solutions on Corda. We can now move on to cash on Corda. And with this, I just wanted to probably spend two more minutes on sharing on some of the progress that we have made uh, with central banks. So some of you might be familiar. Uh, Project Jasper, Bank of Canada, phase one, phase two, phase three. Uh, 
Ubin, we're going to talk about it in a bit more detail, but again, started with Ethereum, just like Jasper. These are all pre-Coda days, probably. And then uh, moved on to next things. What's interesting, if you see Project Lion Rock with HKMA, is that the scope of phase one is much broader. And this is, of course, a result of the ecosystem is learning, the platform is maturing, uh, and we can achieve a lot more, a lot faster. Some of these reports are public. Uh, you can, I encourage you to go through them, and uh, feel free to contact us if you have any questions. Now, with R3, we have an unrivaled work on cash, be it the research, be it the IP, be it our projects. Again, we just discussed some of these projects. Be it our partners. So uh, we work with a lot of system integrators, probably over 100 uh, at this stage. And there are law firms, ISVCs that we work with, and opportunities. So that brings us to Project Ubin. Now, Project Ubin, of course, started with Ethereum, uh, as we saw earlier on the slide. The first phase was just about uh, having a financial model, so just pledging, transferring across assets. But the phase two, uh, the aim was to have a collaborative and rapid designing prototype that could essentially decentralize RTGS using a DLT. Now, technology, time and again, has been reducing the role of intermediaries. So this is not the first time that DLT is trying to do that, or people are seeing DLT playing that role. The project was led by MAS and ABS. Accenture was managing and delivering it, uh, and 11 financial institutions with four technology partners. R3, of course, representing Coda, which is our technology platform. Three prototypes were developed, one each on Coda, Fabric, and Coral. The scope was similar or same across all the th three streams. The 13-week project did achieve an LSM, a decentralized LSM, without compromising pri privacy. So these were the key requirements when we started Ubin journey, essentially. These came from the MAS and the Project Steering Committee. And again, being the collaborative nature, it also came from all the participating banks. So essentially fivefold. First, cash issuance. Second, queuing mechanisms. Third, data privacy. Settlement finality. And finally, the LSM mechanisms. Now, when we talk about Corda, we represent cash as an ownable fact. Of course, ownership can then be transferred. So you see our example here in which Alice is owning $10 cash, but she could then transfer it to Bob in which she has made a payment, but the owner has now changed to Bob. When we look at obligations, though, these are a shared fact. Of course, Alice and Bob, at any given point in time, should share this fact. As Alice owes $10 to Bob, payable by a certain date, and there can be a certain penalty. These obligations can then be queued to form a queuing mechanism, essentially. Privacy. This is something unique to Coda across other DLT platforms. Uh, we do not have a broadcast mechanism. We share data only on a need-to-know basis uh, using point-to-point -point communication. Confidential identities was something utilized in, co in the Ubin prototype to essentially mask the identities of the transacting parties, the parties which had the obligations, and shared only on a need-to-know basis. Fourth, we had the deterministic settlement finality. Now, this is, again, not new to people who are familiar with databases, atomicity or, uh, is required. So tra a transaction in Coda is basically an indivisible, irreducible set of changes that either all occur or nothing occurs. Right? We can all imagine a scenario in which an obligation has moved from one state to the other, but cash has probably not. This, that's certainly undesirable, and that's pretty much unique to Coda in which we achieve this. Some of these things can also be seen in the reports, uh, if you can go through that. Now, remember like, the fifth thing was LSM. So liquidity savings mechanism is essentially the consensus service. Now, Coda is unique in which we actually decouple the consensus mechanism from the ledger. 
This unique capability uh, allows us to have an open network of nodes that can freely connect to each other, but also retain privacy. Notary is our term for this group of servers operated uh, by a consensus pool and providing a uniqueness service, which also means that this service, since it's decoupled, it's actually pluggable, and pluggable at a transaction level, not just a system level. The algorithms can be tailored to transaction types, and currently we have a few of these implemented. So to summarize, uh, these were the key requirements we went through, and these were CODA's approach uh, to meeting them, right? So we met cash issuance by using cash contract, queuing by obligation contracts, data privacy by data propagation only to relevant nodes, uh, settlement finality by atomicity of transactions, and for LSMs, we had range of innovative options because the consensus services were essentially pluggable. So next, I'm going to share some of the observations that were made by third party. So these are essentially observations uh, in the report, the open report, uh, which we can highlight a few challenges uh, that were in the prototype as well as few achievements, right? And then we can summarize them as well. And finally, we'll have the demo. So if you look at the problem, right, the problem was essentially broken down into four pieces. First, uh, all payments were modeled as obligations. Payments were made against all obligations. In terms of prioritization of obligations, the steering committee chose essentially each node will prioritize its own obligations, and each node will choose how much liquidity it will offer towards netting operations. Now, bear in mind, these are all just implementation choices that were made for the prototype, right? Now, these implementation choices actually introduced some challenges, which were not unique to Corda. They were actually across all the four systems. So first, privacy. You do not want to reveal everyone's unsettled payments. Second, scalability. We need fast convergence. Third, around resilience. You can't stop the world. So just because we have uh, many gridlock scenarios, you can't stop the world if you're settling, if you're triggering LSM algorithms. And finally, deterministic finality. It's essentially referring to incomplete, no incomplete states. Now, as basic as they may sound, implementing all of these was a challenge across the DLT platforms. So let's look at what third parties had to say about privacy uh, using Corda on this frame, right? So privacy was inherent. Of course, the data was shared only on a need-to-know basis instead of a global broadcast. Confidential identity, as we shared, was actually a unique pair, public pair, per transaction between the sender and the receiver. So this helped in shielding the participants' identities and hence achieving another uh, privacy angle. Now, in Ubin phase two prototype, the transaction amount was not shielded. This was just an algorithm choice uh, that was made during the prototype. As we discussed, consensus algorithms are pluggable, and we highly recommend using a relevant design choice for any production implementation. Next, we can discuss about scalability and performance. So to allow load balancing and, single po and avoiding single point of failure, multiple notary services or clusters are, of course, required. In Ubin, we, we used a single notary service, and this was just a function of 13 weeks prototype. Uh, but in production, multiple notary services or notary clusters are highly recommended. Now, transaction graphs uh, can be trimmed through reissuance of assets. This, was, uh, this is a feature, again, in Corda, which is actually becomes a scalability challenge in other platforms. So not every platform is able to retain the provenance uh, as the system scales. And uh, this is something that, again, Accenture in their report, uh, along with other financial institutions, highlighted. Uh, Finally, uh, payment instructions can be processed while gridlock resolution is running. So the system does not need to uh, freeze. Uh, 
the network continues to operate without dependency on any participant. This is, again, something that was achieved on Corda. Uh, not every other DLT platform in this project was able to claim that. And we discussed the single notary services uh, could be uh, a bit more scalable, but that was beyond the scope of this project. The notary, of course, ensured finality by obtaining a notary signature. All the participants needed to sign it. And the atomic nature of a gridlock settlement. Now, this is certainly important. So as an LSM algorithm solution, uh, there are a number of transactions that the solution uh, needs to go through. Only Coda was able to have an atomic transaction as part of the settlement. So essentially, one could say that we fulfilled all these challenges. And these, very, these come very clearly in the report in terms of privacy, scalability, resilience, and finality. In terms of road ahead for Rubin, what we discussed till now was phase one and phase two. There are some future phases of Rubin that MAS has laid out. And we are hoping that cross-border uh, will be probably sometime in coming months. With that, I think I can give you a short demo uh, of some of the core features. So in terms of a decentralized gridlock resolution, uh, what you see on the slide is a sample representation of how the system was set up. So uh, there were essentially 11 banks, each represented by a node. Uh, just for clarity purposes, we have shown a few banks here. Um, and of course, the MAS playing as a central bank as well as a regulator. We just separated those two nodes for simplicity purposes and a simulated interface. So if you look at a scenario in which uh, essentially JP Morgan is pledging MAS a million dollars, Credit Suisse starts with a balance of zero. Let's show that. So this is the actual, uh, these are all transactions happening on the DLT platform, uh, but shown on a UI, right? So this is the real Ubin demo taking place. So you just saw pledging, right? So JP Morgan now has a balance of a million dollars. You, sh you, can shoo, uh, you can actually see the issuer of the cash is MAS. So now we can just have a fund transfer from JP Morgan to Credit Suisse. And the transaction priority will set as normal. So as you can see, the balance is updated between JP Morgan and Credit Suisse. Now you can see a redemption next. So JP Morgan is redeeming 190,000. And you can see the balance being updated now, 210 for JP Morgan. It should still be 700 for Credit Suisse. Next, we can actually see the queuing. Uh, so these are, again, three transactions coming from JP Morgan to Credit Suisse with different amounts. You can see the priority is still normal for all of these. The status is active. Uh, now, so of course, JP Morgan does not have that much balance probably to clear all of them. Uh, but let's go step by step and see the, all the features that were in the platform. So you can see the position becoming negative. 
and you can see the outgoing queue being populated by these three transactions, all of which are normal. And you can see the balance for Credit Suisse is still 700, but the position is being updated. Now let's try and update a transaction from normal to high priority. Now this was again one of the features implemented on Ubin in transactions being able to have different priority statuses uh, and different statuses being active, being on hold, being canceled, and then brought back into the queue. So we'll, we'll see some of those features now. So let's see what happens when you update the priority of a particular payment. So the blue arrow there is kind of denoting the priority, and we just changed one to high. What that shows also is that the queue sequence changed. The next thing uh, we'll see is the 150K transaction being put on hold. So this is, again, the status being changed. Next, to meet the obligations, JP Morgan has essentially, as a sample bank, of course, has, uh, is trying to now pledge 350,000 to MASH and MEPS Plus system. So the balance should be updated. And that should enable, essentially, uh, to settle at least the 280K high priority transaction. So you see the balance is being updated on both sides, the positions are updated on both sides, and the outgoing queue is essentially empty for Credit Suisse, sorry. Next, we can try and cancel a transaction. Now, in real life, of course, canceling of a transaction can happen due to multiple reasons, either the transacting parties are canceling it, or be the regulator, or some other requirements. And this was, again, just to see if the system can meet all these requirements. So you can see we have still two payments in the queue from JPMC to Credit Suisse. We just canceled one of those transactions, and the queue is updated. And you can see in the transaction history the canceled transaction as well. Now here we are trying to reactivate uh, the on-hold transaction. And then potentially processing that transaction. and you see the balance being updated. That's it. Excellent, thanks, Sid. And Sid will be around if anybody has any further questions. Um, I'll just give it just a minute, machine. just in case other people do. Yeah, all right, all right. Thank you. Um, yeah, I have a question about uh, uh, using multiple notary clusters. Um, a, a notary service provides ordering and uniqueness um, per notary uh, uh, service, um, per notary cluster. So if you have multiple, uh, you can do that on m multiple uh, asset classes. Um, so then I assume that uh, you modeled different asset classes um, on one uh, Corda DLT. Is that correct? So I think it uh, depends on how you implement it. So each business network operator will uh, 
and probably Mike can answer this as well. So uh, the way I understand it is that it purely depends on what each notary cluster's role is. And if you're thinking of it being representing different assets, that can be one use case. But there could be uh, different roles for those different notary clusters, be it regulatory, be it uh, watch guard, be it uh, just signing. Uh, so yeah. That's the way I understand. No, that's a good explanation. I think it's uh, largely you can think of the notary, and, and I refer to them as notary pools now to ensure that uh, it gives the notion that there's a set of distrusting entities operating them. So we still that's still a very basic concept in the in a distributed system. Um, but the effectively what the notary is doing in a non-validating state is simply looking at the outputs of a previous transaction and making sure that it hadn't signed them previously just to make sure that it's unique. So that's the ordering. So if two, two come in, the first goes through. Um, because they're really just hashes, whatever they represent in the transaction itself is arbitrary. So um, now if you run it in a validating mode, it's slightly different, but it still is actually just executing the contract. So the notaries are, are very independent of the contract itself. So you don't need to worry about um, having notaries represent particular uh, states, as an example. Yeah, the, the, the uh, concern I had is um, if you have uh, several clusters of notaries, uh, they uh, provide uniqueness and uh, ordering per cluster. So if you have separate ones, then uh, you can only apply it with separate asset classes. Uh, no, because the if you think, um, so a notary has oversight of to what's been sp spent effectively. But if you'd like to use two, two assets that were under different notaries, there's, uh, there's a, a transaction that simply moves them under the same notary so that it has oversight over those future spend states. Uh, so you don't need, it still doesn't need to worry about uh, any association of either the issuer or the state type at all. Uh, the notary can run completely independent of that. So it can effectively run by its network participants and just acting as consensus over hashes effectively.